All right. Welcome to Thursday, week four. Woohoo. All right. We're going to do tackle chapter seven today. Chapter seven is super useful information, and we'll be using the same um, calculator function. We will use and learn a new calculator function. You will will use that calculator function through the rest of this term. It's a super useful one. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot about normal curves today. So your the empirical rule will still be helpful, especially as far as outliers go. But um, we're going to make it more precise. So this will be the math that I told you. Don't use the math the tutors give you. Use the empirical rule. This is that math that the tutors would be giving you. So now is the time to use it. So 7.1, we're going to talk about what a uniform probability distribution is and talk about how to use that. It's pretty short, pretty boring. And so then we get to the normal curve. The normal curve is super interesting, in my opinion, but I love this stuff. And talk about what that graph looks like and different ways that it can look, all shapes and sizes. Uh, we're going to talk about what the properties of that normal curve are and what a normal density function is and the different ways to interpret it. Then 7.2, we're going to find the area under the curve. We're going to... Um, use our calculator, find a fancy schmancy function. We will also be using the Z table, which I need to go to that right now and open it up. Hold on a second here. The Z table is located in the, I believe it's in the week four stuff. Is it outside also? No, I believe it's in the week four stuff. Uh, the Z and T tables right down here. I'm gonna open that up and we will um, look at that today also. So those tables are useful. We will look at those. So we're going to look at how to do it with the Z table and how to use it, do it with your calculator. The Z table can be pretty elegant at times. Uh, the calculator is fast. And if you never want to use a Z table, you don't necessarily have to. So, but I'm going to show you how to use it. When I was in high school, um, that's all we had. We didn't have these fancy calculators. All we had were Z tables and T tables and all of these other crazy things like that. We didn't have that stuff because I was in high school in the eighties because I'm old. So there you go. Uh, printing out the Z table is probably a good idea. If you decide you want to use it, um, it's probably useful, especially since later on, it's going to give you some critical values and things that like the most common of them. So I would probably print it and have it put it just in your notes. It'd be useful for sure. So yeah, it's it's a great, it's a useful tool. And we're going to refer to it a couple more times. Uh, we'll look at it, I think chapter eight, we'll look at it again. Actually, I don't think chapter eight, I think chapter nine and chapter 10. I think we'll look at it both then. So yeah, printing it out is probably a good idea. So it also couldn't be a terrible idea if you have a one of those sleeves, you know, those sleeves and a dry erase marker it probably would not be a bad idea to put it in a sleeve so you can write on it and then just erase it. Probably not a bad idea. It's not necessary, absolutely necessary, but I would probably do it. Okay, so let's move. Let's actually get into the material here. Ooh, my thing's doing wonky stuff. Why is it being mean to me? Okay, so we talked about what a uniform graph looks like. It just looks like a rectangle because every single outcome has the same probability of happening. So if I looked at the probability of rolling a one, rolling a two, rolling a three, four, five, six on a six-sided dice, it would be a uniform probability distribution because the probability of rolling each one is the same. So the example we have here is that we have a friend who's always late. He could be between zero and 30 minutes and he is equally likely to be late any of the times along the zero to 30 minutes. He's equally likely to be three to four minutes late as he is to be 25 to 26 minutes late. I have family members like that. I have begun telling them to be places 30 minutes early so that they're on time. I'm an early person. I 15 minutes early is on time. Anything after that to me is late. That's just the way I am. Okay. So a random, the random variable X in this case can take on any value between zero and 30. Um, so I'm gonna draw the uniform probability distribution and on our 
I guess not yet. Where is it? Okay, we'll get there in a second. So a probability density function. So we use it to compute probability. So when we draw it, we can take the area under the drawing and that is our density function. So the area underneath our graph, you'll see in a minute what it looks like. Under The area under the graph is always going to equal one. And our height of the graph is gonna be greater than or equal to zero because all probably, probabilities, all things have a probability of between zero and one. So my height of the graph is not gonna be greater than zero. So my vertical axis is that probability of the thing happen. It's like that probability histogram that we looked at. So the height is the probability. And then the, um, the X value, my random variable outcome is on the Y axis. Let's take a look at what it looks like. So this is the probability density function uh, for the random variable of zero to 30 minutes late. So because this every single minute has an equal probability of happening, every every random or every time between zero and 30 minutes has a 1 30th chance of happening. That's why the height of my rectangle is 1 30th because every minute between zero and 30 minutes has a 1 30th chance of happening. So this is the density function here. This is not lovely and beautiful like our normal curve, but it works. It's a nice pretty rectangle that if I multiply 30 by one over 30, I get one. So we're gonna do some problems on this. So we wanna know the probability that my friend will be between 20 minutes, 10 and 20 minutes late. So this is what it looks like right here. It's this rectangle right here. So we want to know the probability of his lateness landing somewhere in here between 10 and 20 minutes. So this rectangle has a width of 10 and a height of 1 30th. So if I just find the area of that rectangle, I can find the probability that he'll be between 10 and 20 minutes late. So that's 10 minutes times 1 over 30 which gives me 10 thirtieths or one third, which is 33.3% chance. So he has a 33.3% chance of being between 10 and 20 minutes late. So all we did was find the area of that and it works perfectly. See, I guess there is math, but it's not the hard math. This is like, this is the easy, super easy math right there. Is there math there? No. All right, questions on what I just did there? Okay. So the next question asks me, it's 10 a.m. There's a 20% probability that my friend is going to arrive between the next how many minutes? So he's supposed to be somewhere at 10 a.m. And I wanna know how many minutes is that 20% probability. So I want to know 130 times what equals 0 0.2 because I know that 130 times whatever that width is is going to equal 20%, which is 0 0.2. So all I've got to do is, yes, you could divide by 1 over 30, but that's kind of cringy. So I'm just going to multiply both sides by 30. So that's going to clear that fraction. So x equals 6. So there's a 20% chance that he will arrive within the next six minutes. Questions? Right, that is our uniform probability, that's it. I'm moving on. Our uniform distribution, we're moving on. We want, we're gonna do some bell shape because normal is much better than uniform. All right, this is our normal curve. So um, when we have this nice, beautiful, symmetric bell-shaped curve, it is a normal curve. 
and it is beautiful. It's lovely. It has that nice shape. They're not always this perfect. I mean, this one's not completely perfect. And this right here, this right here is a little bit higher. This is a little bit higher. So, I mean, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's pretty darn close. It's close enough. We call it relatively normal or mostly normal or approximately normal. We don't deal in absolutes. So if it's close enough, it's close enough. So I wouldn't worry about little tiny bits of skew here and there, as long as it's not really noticeably skewed, as long as you don't end up with something that my pen keeps shutting itself off like this, you know, like a wave over there. And as long as we don't end up with something weird like that, then you're probably okay. So as long as it's somewhat symmetrical, we're going to call it symmetric and call it normal and just go with it. So um, I'm not even going to deal with inflection points. That's very calculus of us. So um, when we're dealing with a normal probability distribution, if you're told something's normally distributed or you're told it's a normal probability distribution, it's going to look like this. Um, it's going to be bell-shaped. It's going to be symmetric. Inflection points are a calculus thing, and I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, it talks about con concavity and all of that. So if you took calculus, then you know what an inflection point is, and I'll just let you sit there and happily um, bask in your knowledge. Okay. So this is some different ways that a um, normal curve can look. So it could be centered right about zero, like this pink one right here. Like this pink one is has zero right in the middle and it's nice and pretty, or it could be moved over because this one right here has a mean of three. So it's still a normal curve, it's just moved over. So on the bottom, those are also normal curves, but one is, has a smaller standard deviation, so it like goes higher. And then the blue one has a larger standard deviation, so it's more spread out. It's a little bit flatter and more spread out. But all of these are normal curves. They all are. They all have that nice bell shaped. Just some of them are pointier bells. Some of them are moved over. You know, they're, it doesn't matter what space they take up on the um, on the number line, as long as they have this nice bell shaped and they don't have a, um, a skew. So these are just different ways you can see a normal curve. But what you also can notice about this is that these curves, it would be hard to compare them because take a look right here. Let me see here. Look at what it looks like, what one standard deviation from the mean looks like here, as opposed to this one right here. These go way over here. So it would be harder to compare them because they have different means and standard deviations. And we're gonna take we're gonna take care of that in a minute. We're gonna talk about standardizing it. If we can standardize things. So remember back last chapter, I believe, we standardized things by using z-scores when we compared the two basketball players. Might have been two chapters ago um, or three. When we compared the basketball players, when we compared the uh, baseball teams. So we, if they have different means and different standard deviations, we can't compare them. When we use z-scores, we standardize them. So then, then we can compare things. And that's kind of what we're going to do in a minute. So properties of a normal density curve, it's symmetric about the mean. You are not going to be grilled about these things. This is just things for you to know when you're knower. You don't need to take make a long list of these. I'm not going to grill you about them. They're symmetric about the mean. Um, the mean and the median equal each other, so it has a nice single peak. And the highest point is at the mean. The area under the curve is 1. And 50% of the area is on the right of the mean. 50% of the area is on the left of the mean. This is what a normal curve looks like. Makes sense. It's symmetric. As X gets larger and larger and larger, it is going to approach the graph, but it's never going to reach that horizontal axis. Um, if you know the word asymptote, you'll know what I'm talking about. It gets closer and closer and closer to... Um, though the x-axis, but it will never touch it. 
the empirical rule applies when it is a normal curve. When it's a nice, pretty, um, symmetrical, normal curve, the empirical rule applies. So 68% of the area or about it is between is within one standard deviation, 95% within two, and 99.7 within three. So if you have a normal curve, you can estimate those. We're gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how to get more precise, but you can kind of estimate it. So just like when you're eyeballing it or saying, oh yeah, that's within one standard deviation. So that'll be about 68%. It's not exact, it's just really close. Kind of like, have you, I don't know if you've ever um, converted um, the Celsius to Fahrenheit in your head when you see Celsius and you're like, I wonder what that is in Fahrenheit you know that you um, double it and add 30, and that approximates it. So if someone says, um, it's 22 degrees, and they're talking Celsius, then you double it, 44 plus, plus 30, it's about 74 degrees. It's really close. It's not exact, but it's really close. It's kind of how the empirical rule is to the actual probabilities. All right, moving on. This is our normal distribution. You've seen this many, many, many times. I've probably drawn it for you eight times. You've probably drawn it yourself four or five or eight times. So this is just the normal curve. This is a normal distribution. We've already been dealing with it, which is instead of calling it a symmetric curve or bell curve, we're now gonna call it the normal distribution. All right, it's the same thing we've already done. Look at how many slides we've already gone through and it's only 5.30. All right. So we're gonna take a look at 52 year old males, humans. I'm not gonna make you put it in your calculator. I'm gonna show you a histogram. We're gonna talk about um, whether or not it's normally distributed and um, you'll see, it'll be good. Okay, so um, asking right now if we think it's normally distributed, you, most things end up being normally distributed. So most of the time we say, yeah, it's probably normally distributed. Here's the data. All right, here's my nice curve, my nice normal curve. This is a nice histogram. I can draw a bell over it and it looks pretty symmetric. It looks like a pretty nice bell. Obviously it's not perfect because very few things that occur in nature turn out perfectly perfect, but it is pretty darn close. It looks like a nice curve. So when we have this nice normal density curve drawn over the histogram, I can take the area, let's take the area right here of these things right here. And, we're, and what we wanna know is how does this area um, relate to, how does the area of just that relate to the curve between these two heights? So just that piece of the histogram. So if I cut this, well, oh, that's not a pen, that is a highlighter. So if I cut this off right here, most of this could fit into this spot right here. There'd be a little bit left over, but it's pretty darn close to the same area as under that curve. As we're statisticians, we don't deal in absolutes, but it's so it's pretty darn close. You could pretty much just say, yeah, that's about the same area. Close enough. Close enough for government work, as they say. Okay. So here's what area under the curve means. So this right here is what it's going to mean. If I randomly selected um, a one child, what is the probability that it would be between 34.5 and 35.5? That is this second thing right here. The first one right here is the proportion of the population with that characteristic. So I could say that whatever that area is, that we would expect that percent of the population of two-year-old males to be between those two values. So it's either the proportion of the population that is within that interval, or it is the probability that a randomly selected um, individual is between those two values. They both basically mean the same thing and how you answer the question depends on how it's being asked. They ask you, what proportion of all males, um, all two-year-old males, are between 34.5 and 35.5 inches tall? 
then you would answer it that way. Or if they say, if I randomly select one two-year-old male, what's the probability he would be between those two heights? Then you would answer it that way. It just depends on how it's asked. Questions before I move on? I have examples. Okay. Let's look at giraffes. So the weight of giraffes are approximately normally distributed with the mean of 2,200 pounds and the standard deviation of 200 pounds. We're gonna draw a normal curve. Um, we're gonna use these with my normal curve. We're gonna label it underneath. And we're gonna shade the area under the normal curve to the left. And then we're gonna take a look at um, the area under that curve. So let's just take a look here. So I took it and I my mean is right here. And then I have one standard deviation, I think, at 200 pounds, yep. No, that's not right. So one standard deviation, there's two, uh oh. There's one standard deviation. There's two standard deviations, there's three. Here's one above, two, three. So this area right here is 0 0.3085. That's what that area is right here. So the area to the left, so the less than. So the probability that a randomly selected giraffe weighs less than 2,100 pounds is about 30.85%. The proportion of giraffes whose weight is less than 2,100 pounds is 30.85%. So depending on what question you're being asked, you're gonna answer it one of those two ways. Questions? All right. This is, we're in 7.2, can you believe it? That was 7.1, we are done with 7.1. This is the reason that they're put together because they're, they, they just kind of smoosh into each other. Okay, y'all remember Z-scores, right? So you take the data value that you have, you subtract the mean, and then you divide by the standard deviation. A random variable X is normally distributed with a mean mu and standard deviation sigma, so we can use this for a z-score. If we take every single data value that exists and we create z-scores out of them, and then we can graph the z-score, then we have standardized the random normal variable. So instead of using data values on my curve, I'm using z-scores. The nice thing about that is that when you're using z-scores, your mean is always zero and your standard deviation is always one. It makes life really easy. So you could take any data and you can standardize it so that you're dealing with z-scores. And it's really nice. You're gonna have questions in your homework that talk about comparing um, the ACT exam with the SAT exam because those are two different standards that colleges use for admissions. So being able to compare those, you'll be able to compare their Z-scores. So you can find which score goes with this Z-score and, you know, say, did this person do better than that person, depending on Z-scores. So it standardizes it so that we're kind of using all the same units. It's like converting inches to feet or meters to feet so that you can compare the same thing rather than saying, oh, man, it's really hot. It's 70 degrees here. It's only 22 degrees where you are. Yeah, one is using Celsius and the other is using Fahrenheit. If you bring them to the same thing, it's easier to compare it. So that's what we're going to be doing here. All right. IQ scores can be modeled with a normal distribution with the mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. So an individual whose IQ score is 120 is 1.33 standard deviations above the mean. So this right here is the Z-score of someone with a 120 IQ. That's their Z-score. And the nice thing is, is we know a lot about Z-scores. Just looking at 120, I'd be like, yeah, that looks like it's pretty smart. But using a Z-score, you'd be like, okay, so it's one and a third standard deviations above average. That's pretty good. 
But if 68% of all people are between with, within one standard deviation of the mean, then I'm doing pretty good if I'm at 120. So when you understand what a z-score means, it actually is kind of cool looking at them. Okay, so um, I don't like this z-table as much as I like our z-table, so I'm going to jump to our z-table in a minute. But so the way that we use a z-table, so a z-table looks at values to the left. So if I was going to draw this, and this is going to be perfect, this is my mean. Here's my data value. It's 1.33. The Z table is going to give me the area to the left of my data value. Gives me the left of it. So I'm going to look at the Z score of 1.33, and I'm going to find the area under the curve to the left of it. So the way that the Z table works is along the left, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger, is to the left or the, on the left side right here, I have the whole number and I have the tenths place. Along the top, I have the hundredths place. So a 1.33 Z score, I go down to 1.3 and then I go over to the hundredths place of three and I get 0 0.9082. So I'm gonna write that down. Whoa, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so this area right here is 0 0.9082. So what it's saying is that a person with an IQ score of 120 is in the 90.8 percentile of all people with IQs. So it is greater than or equal to, you have an IQ score greater than or equal to 90.82% of the population if you have 120 IQ. That is pretty darn cool. So what you're saying, what, what I'm going to say is if I randomly select a person, randomly select a human being, a human being, there's a 90.82% chance that their IQ will be 120 or below. That's the interpretation here. So that probability slash area slash proportion you can find on your Z-score. I'm gonna show you on our Z-score, our Z-table. Ours looks a little bit different. Okay, Let me make. I need to make this bigger. Come on, how come you're not zooming? I don't know why it's not zooming. Okay, it doesn't wanna zoom when I do my little thing. So we're just gonna to have to um, be blind. So 1.3 is way down here. 1.3 is way down here. I don't think I have hours on here. No, I don't. Okay, 1.3 is way down here. And then you see there's 0, 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So I want this column and this right here. I don't know why it's not, grr. This is really frustrating. I don't know. Okay, so 1.3 is right there. So 1.33, 0 0.9082. This gives you a little picture of it to remind you that we use the area to the left, this picture up here. So on our slide right here, so what if I was looking for the probability that someone had a, an IQ greater than 120? Well, you have to use the complement rule. Because the Z table gives us to the left in order to get to the right, because the area under the whole curve is one, you do one minus. So one minus 0 0.9082 gives us this right here. So we have about a 9.2% chance of randomly choosing a person with an IQ greater than 120. So you just have to use the complement rule to get the other part. However, we have a lovely, lovely calculator that I'm gonna show you in a minute how to use it to, um, I, we can get right or left and we don't have to do this fancy stuff with the, with the Z table. I do like the Z table though, but don't worry. We will be doing that in a second. Questions so far? 
Okay, so far easy peasy lemon squeezy. All right, here's how we use the calculator. In your calculator, you'll hit the second button and then the VARS button. We hit that on Tuesday. We did that on Tuesday. And you're going to go down to normal CDF. I'm going to pop over there to the calculator because we're going. I'm just going to use the um, the um, IQ scores. Okay, so we can't use infinity. So remember our um, our curve. It, it, as our x gets super super big or super super small, it gets really close to the x axis, but it never hits it. We need to use infinity for our highest and our lowest values. So we're going to do second button right here and then hit VARS. We want normal CDF. We never use normal PDF ever, ever. Normal CDF is always it. I'm going to go into normal CDF. So if we, I'm going to do less than uh, 120 first less than, and then we will do greater than afterwards. So, and we're gonna do Z-scores and then we'll do actual data values. So our Z-score was 1.33. In order to get this, so that what this is, negative one E99, when if you ever see the E in your calculator, I'm sure you've seen it before where you get an answer that's like, I'm just gonna put it, don't, don't type this in here. You might've seen answers like this, zero point, no, 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 2.3. Eight, and then you see an E, and then you see negative four. You, you've seen things like this come up in your calculator. What this is is scientific notation. This is saying 2.8 times 10 to the negative fourth power. So this is telling you to move the decimal place, move the decimal right here, four places to the left. This is scientific notation in your calculator. So what this is right here, this is negative one times 10 to the 99th power. So I would take the decimal, so this decimal, and I would move it 99 places to the left. That is basically negative infinity. It just is. We're just calling it as low as you possibly can get, okay? So the way that you put this in your calculator, I'm going to... Um, you'd put, I'm going to clear this. You hit the negative button is right here next to enter. This is the negative button, negative one. The E is not the letter E that's by sign. It is this E that's with commons, comma. See E, E right here? So you hit second comma, and that gives you this teeny tiny little E. And then 99. We use that when it's the lower value, when you're doing less than. If you're doing less than, use negative 1E99 e and you're lower. This is your lower bound. My upper is 1.33 because that's the Z-score. So this is saying less than or equal to 1.33. The lower bound is negative 1E99. E my upper bound is 1.99. We're using Z-scores, so my mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1 because we're using Z-scores. Whenever you're using Z-scores, the mean is zero, standard deviation is one. I'm gonna hit enter. It'll paste it. So if you are on a calculator that doesn't have those options, it'll give you normal CDF and open your parentheses and you can just type it all in here. This is your lower bound, your upper bound, standard deviation and mean. It's on that other screen right here. Lower bound, upper bound, standard deviation and mean. This is one we're using less than or equal to. Okay, I'm gonna hit enter again. And the Z-score rounds, we don't round in the calculator, but it gives us the same value right here, the 0 0.9082, which is exactly the same thing we got from the Z-table. I'm gonna do it the same thing with greater than. Let's do it again. Second VARS, normal CDF, so 1.33 is going to be my lower value because I want to go greater than 1.33. Now, the equal to doesn't matter. If I say greater than or equal to or just greater than, it doesn't matter. It's the exact same thing. All right. So now I need to do positive infinity. So I'm just going to do 1E99 because it is positive infinity. 
So this is one times 10 to the 99th power. So I'm just moving the decimal 99 places to the right. That's a really big number. That's a one with 99 zeros after it. That's a very large number. We're just calling it infinity, though it really isn't. We're dealing with z-scores. So I put zero and one in there. Paste, once again, if you um, your calculator doesn't have that feature, you can just type them in here with commas. And that's the value that we got right there. All right. Questions? We're gonna I had a quick question. Go ahead. So does it matter if we put um, 133 first for the upper or the lower? No, it needs to be, it, you're going to get weird things if you put it in the wrong way. So this, the top one here is less than or equal to with my lower bound is negative infinity because this would, this gives me to the left of one in, of 1 1.33 and oh, this okay. is giving me to the right of 1.33. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks. Good question though. Good question. All right. Um, I'm going to jump back. We'll do data values in a minute, but right now we're going to stick with z-scores because I don't want to throw lots of confusion in the mix. So we're going to stick with z-scores right now. We'll jump to data values instead of z-scores in a minute. All right. So this is when we're dealing with z-scores. So this example right here, if I put normal CDF, this is less than negative 1.2. So my lower value is the negative infinity. And this right here, I'm gonna put in the notes, you hit second and then the comma button, second comma. Second comma, I don't wanna put the comma, I'm gonna write the word comma. So second comma gives you that E. So this right here would be, this is a lower bound. upper bound mean then standard deviation. So if I was to draw this, I'm drawing this th that for example there. If I was to draw this, a negative 1.2, so this is my mean, a negative 1.2 would be about, let's just say it's right there. So I'm looking for this area right here. So this is negative 1.2, and this goes off to negative 1E99, which is my lower bound. That's why I need, we, we read from left to right on a number line. Think about your normal curve is sitting on a number line. You go left, whatever's on the left first, then what's on the right, and then establish your mean and your standard deviation. So with this, we're always reading from left to right on that, that standard curve or that number line. Hopefully that's helpful because I have this number line right here. There's a number line and I'm reading this direction. All right. Okay. So let's take a look at um, what I'm looking for here. So I'm looking for this right here. So what about if Z is greater than 1.3? So this is 1.30. So I've got this right here on my Z score, 1.30. But I need to go to the, I want to go to the right of it because it's going greater than because 1.3, let's just say that's about here. I want this area up here. The Z table, Z table gives me this. So I need to do one minus whatever the Z table gives me. So you do one minus 0 0.9032. See why we just stick to the calculator? Or the So this would give me, whoo, sorry. So this would give me 0 0.0968. This is why we stick, um, we like to use the calculator instead of the Z table because 
it just ends up being a little extra work, even though there is a little bit of elegance, I feel, using the Z table. So go ahead and try it with your calculator. We're looking for greater than 1.3. So using your calculator, go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to work quietly behind you. If you already had the other one in your calculator, it should be pretty quick. That's what I that's what we got from our Z table. That's what I got on my calculator. How'd we do? Yay! Woohoo! I love it. Any questions about this so far before we move on? Feeling okay? Feeling groovy? Okay, so now what I'm looking for is the area between these two Z values. So I'm gonna draw it. So this Z score right here is negative 1.02. This z-score way over here that I just lost my pen, this one way over here, 2.94. I'm looking for this right here. Okay, I'm gonna explain what you would do if you use a z-table. I think I have it on my next screen. So if I was to use a z-table, I would find, let me go, just go to my Z table somewhere in here. I decided to try again to make it bigger. It didn't work. Okay, so if I was to use my Z table, I would find the Z score for 2.94. So 2.94 gives me the Z score. So four is down here. 2.94 gives me... 0.9084. That's what 2.94 get oh, 9984. See, I can't even can't even see it. 0.9984. Okay. That get that is for 2.94. I'm gonna find the Z score for negative 1.02. So I need negative 1.02, which is right here. This is 0 0.1539. Okay. What the, I'm going to do a couple different highlighters. So what the top one gives me is this area right here. This is the area that I got for 2.94. What the bottom one gave me was this area right here. So you probably could see where I'm going with this. If you subtract them, I would be getting rid of this piece, which would give me, leave me with this right here. So I could do 0.9984 minus 0 And I'm guessing all of you have already put it in your calculator and did and got the um, the actual answer. So here here's what I got. So in your calculator, you're going to put normal CDF. Your lower value is negative one point zero two. The upper value two point nine four. We're dealing with z scores, so we have zero one. That's what you're going to put your in your calculator. So let's go ahead and do this. So lower value, negative 1.02. We don't need to deal with any infinities because it's in between those two values. So there's no infinities here. Upper value, 2.94. Do y'all get approximately 0 0.8445?
whole beans. So because our Z table rounds Z scores to four decimal places, that's usually where we will round them. My open math should tell you, but usually if nobody tells you where to round your Z scores, round to four, because your calculator and the Z table will match. I think my open math assumes you use a Z table. So you can kind of just stick with the four decimal places unless it tells you something different. Questions? I'm gonna move on. Okay. All right. Um, now this tells you, this tells you to convert to Z scores and use the, v the table five. That's great. Do that if you want to. Otherwise, use your technology. Now, you do not, if you have data values, you don't have to convert to Z-scores. You can just use the data values. The important thing is that mean and standard deviation, make sure you put those in there. So I think I have an example coming up here. I don't. This is my, this is your, um, I hate that it has A and B. This is like your rule of thumb place right here. Um, this is the lower. This is the upper and then mean and standard deviation. So if you're looking between two values, your lower and your upper are gonna be that actual, the, the boundaries. If you're doing less than, you're gonna use the negative 1E99 as your lower value. If you're doing greater than, you're gonna use 1E99 as your upper value. So this right here is all you need to know for using normal CDF. So I'm going to jump back before we do this. I'm going to jump back to the um, IQs. Let's go back to the IQs. Okay. So all the way back here. So I'm going to, we're going to ignore this stuff right here right now. So I am looking for the, the probability that someone has an IQ greater than 120. All right. We already calculated this. We already calculated it, but now we're going to do it with data values instead of z-scores. So you don't always have to convert to a z-score. Go back to my calculator. So let's go back into normal CDF. So the lower bound is the negative 1E99. When we're doing less, oh, we're doing greater than, sorry. Lower value is 120 because we're doing greater than. My upper value is 1E99 because 120 or higher goes off to infinity, though I know IQs don't go off to infinity, um, but they go, I don't know exactly where they cut off and infinity is a good number. The mean of IQs is 100. The standard deviation of IQs is 15. So if you are not converting to Z-scores, make sure you put the actual mean and standard deviation into the mean and standard deviation spot. It's gonna look like this when it pastes it. We should get the same probability here. It's slightly off and the reason is because we round z-scores. So this is actually more accurate, but because we round z-scores, things end up slightly different. It's very small. This is 0. 0 0.092, this is 0 0.091, it's one thousandth off. I don't think anybody cares. My open math takes into consideration, so you shouldn't worry about it. Um, but because we round z-scores, that's why we end up with, um, we end up slightly off. All right, we're gonna work backwards now. I'm gonna go all the way back over here. Let's work backwards. All right. So um, what if I wanna know something like the height of a two-year-old male who's in the 20th percentile? Like what if, um, yeah. Or what if I wanna know um, the middle 95 90% of scores? So I wanna know like, what separates the um, like top 5% from the bottom 
you know, like I want to know what the middle 90% are. What's going to put me in the fifth percentile? What's going to put me in the 95th percentile? Sometimes you have a percentile, but you don't have the value that goes with it. So we need to work backwards. We need to go from our, our per probability or, or um, proportion or percentile. We want to go from that to the data values or the z-scores. So we have a, we there's an app for that. I mean, there's a... <laughs> There's a calculator function for that, but there's also a way to do that with your um, Z table. So you can draw a normal curve and you can shade it and all that, make it all pretty. You you can look in the body of the, v, the table to find that Z score. And then you can convert from Z score to the data value. Or you can use this function right here called inverse norm which is the what I recommend you do. We're going to, I'm going to show you how to do it with the Z table or with the, um, and they give you this formula, but all this formula is, I, I kind of don't like that they give you, make it look like it's a whole different formula. All it is, is this formula right here, but they solved for X. It is the same formula. They just solved for X. So it's not really that scary, but it is just the same thing. It's just rearranged. So we're just going to use the Z formula. But inverse norm, I, I don't recommend doing it the other way. You can, but I don't really recommend doing it the other way. Inverse norm is your friend. Okay, can I move on? Okay, so what percentile means is it's less than or equal to. So if somebody's in the, the 80th percentile, then that means 80% um, of all people scored less than or equal to your score. That's what the 80th percentile means. Okay. So the GRE um, has a normal is normally distributed with a mean of 1049 and a standard deviation of 189. We want to know what the score of a student is whose percentile is ranked at the 85th. I'm going to show you with the Z table and then we're going to use inverse norm. Let's see here. So here's my Z table. So we want to know we're going to go to 0.85 because that's what you do. So take a look. We're going to look in the body. So I'm going to look in here in this body and look for as close to 80, 0.85 as I can find. So notice I have 0.8485 right there and 0.8508 right there. The Z score that's closest is 1.04. This one's closest to 0.85. So that's the Z score that we're gonna use. We're gonna use the Z score of 1.04. I'm gonna jump back to the other page real quick. So I have a Z score. So remember my this is my um, X minus mean divided by standard deviation. I have that my Z score is 1.04. That's my Z score. I don't know the data value. I know the mean is 1049. Whoops. The mean is 1049 and the standard deviation is 189. So now we're just going to use our, um, we're just going to use the our algebra to determine what data value that is. Multiply both sides by 189. I, I, this is the only time you have to do it this way. Maybe. I'm gonna add 1049. So I have 1245.56 equals X. So the, the score, the GRE score that corresponds with the 85th percentile is about 1245.56. So that is the 85th percentile. I think that I have that on the next screen, but. So all I did was algebra here. Just did the, just algebra it out, mathed it out as I always say. So all I did was do the calculations 
And it's it could be tedious if you had a lot of these to do. It could be pretty tedious, even though I enjoy it, but I'm weird. I did major in math. So anytime I say I loved it, um, just remember I chose to major in math. And so, yeah, do with it what you will. So we rounded it to 1246. So a person who scores 1246 on the GRE would rank in the 85th percentile. So let's use our calculator function. Let's pop on over to my fancy schmancy. I'm going to clear everything out because I like a clear screen. Once again, we do second and then VARS. Right under normal CDF is inverse norm. Hit enter. We're looking at the 85th percentile, so we're going to do 0.85. And I want to use the mean and the standard deviation given to me by GRE. I am not going to use these scores. I do not want to use these scores. So I'm going to use the mean of 1049 and the standard deviation of 189. Okay. Percentiles are less than or equal to. Most of you do not have this left, center, right. So default is left, and I'm just going to always use left unless somebody's confused and has this on their calculator, and I can help them. But most people don't. So it just defaults to left, and we're just going to call it good, and I'm just going to use left. I'm not going to use any other thing unless somebody says, I have that. Can you help me out? All right. So we're just going to left is what you guys have if you don't have anything. So I'm going to hit paste. I'm going to hit enter. This is about what we got. We got 1245.56, and it's really close. It's a rounding thing because we used the Z-score of 1.05 plus. Remember, our um, the 1.04 Z-score corresponded to slightly higher of a percentile. Remember, it was 0 0.8508. It was slightly higher. So this is more accurate. The 1245 is more accurate. Questions? I have a question. Yes. So when we're doing our homework um, and it asks us questions like this, mm -hmm. if we use a Z table, we're going to have a slightly different answer than if we do all the math like you just did. So how are we going to know which one for the question? Almost every problem, um, the my open math knows but it has both answers as the correct answer. Oh, I, I believe that there's one question. I don't remember if it's in chapter seven or not. There is a question somewhere that does weird things with the rounding. So if, if you get it wrong and then it gives you the correct answer and you were like, you know, hey, this is just a rounding thing or whatever, just let me know and I'll give you the points. But um, I think there's just one question that my open math is rude about, but it, it takes into consideration both using the calculator and the C table. So you should be fine. All right. You're welcome. I'm sure somebody else had that same question. So perfect. All right. So I would like you with your fancy calculator to find what the weight of a giraffe would be in the 75th percentile. If the mean is 2,200 pounds and the standard deviation is 200 pounds. So go ahead in your calculator, use your inverse norm. So it's going to look like this. I'm assuming that you guys don't have that center left, right. I didn't say what to round to, so you can, let's just round to the nearest whole number. This is what I got. How'd we do? Okay. Questions, comments, queries, concerns. We're almost done. We're on slide 39 of 42. We are so close to done. We're not even at 630. Look at that. We rock.
We even chatted for a little bit first and looked at problems. Okay. So, um, second here. So this one is, is um, a little bit different here. So we know the length of a certain steel rod is normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 0 0.45. The manufacturer wants to accept 90% of all rods manufactured. We want to know the length of the rods that make up the middle 90%. This is where most of the issues land with this, um, this homework assignment and, and the test. This is where most of the issues are. Drawing a picture can be helpful. Let me draw it. So I have... Right here, this is the middle 90%. If I have the middle 90%, this there's 5% down here, and there's 5% up here, right? Because it's the middle 90%. So I have 5% above, and I have 5% um, below. Therefore, with your inverse norm, you're going to do inverse norm with 0 0.05 and 0.95. Do not... Do inverse norm with 0.9. You're going to get the wrong answer. You need to use two of them because there's two data values we're looking for. So you do inverse norm with 0 0.05 and inverse no norm with 0.95 to get two different values. So you're going to be doing it twice. So I'm going to pop over here, and I know I see it at the bottom, but we're going to do it anyway. So second bars. See, this is where I would use center if I had it, if you had it. So I'm going to do 0 0.05 first, and my mean is 100, and standard deviation is 0.45. So this gives me 99.26 centimeters. And then I'm going to do it again, 0.95, go down here again, gives me 100.74 centimeters. So that's going to give me the boundaries of my middle 90%. So if they ask you middle 95%, um, you're going to have 2.5% above and 2.5% below. Middle 80%, you'll have 10% above and 10% below. So be really careful with that. Be really careful. If you need to draw the picture, sometimes drawing the picture just makes it make sense in your head when you're saying center. Where is the 95 coming from? Because this is there, if there's 5% up above, then this is the 0.95 mark. There's 95% below that. Because this is the middle 90%, there's 5% above that 90% and 5% below. Remember the whole thing is 100? Oh, uh, okay. Does that help? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. You're welcome. Anyone else? That was really great. We just did this one. This is the same thing. Okay, so I guess there isn't another example. I thought I had another example. I guess I don't. All right, that's the last slide. And we we don't have a lab this week, so we're good. Questions on this, are we? I'd see, I don't wanna do this by hand. This would not be fun doing this one by hand with the Z table. You absolutely can if you want, but I, why convert to Z scores if you don't have to? That's what I want to know. If you don't have to convert to Z-scores, then don't. I do want to look at one of the questions and the homework before we go, but I want to make sure there's not any questions before we go. Okay. I'm going to move over here to my open math. And there is a question in the 7.1 and 2 homework that I want to, that's not what I want to do. Let's go back. Teacher preview gives me everything at a glance. I like it better. Okay. Uh, sh 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 
Okay. Well, there's a couple things I want to look at. I'm going to, because I had the, the other thing on my mind first. Okay. So this right here. So this right here talks about S SAT scores and ACT scores. So this says if, it's, if an SAT score is in the 69th percentile, what is that SAT score? So you need to determine what that SAT score is using inverse norm. That's pretty simple to do. You can use inverse norm with 69 and it gives you the um, mean and standard deviation. But now what it wants to know is what is the equivalent ACT score? There's two different things that you can do. You can either find the ACT score at the 69th percentile, which is what I recommend, or you can find the Z score of the SAT score and then find the ACT score that has that same Z score. I don't recommend that. I recommend just finding the ACT score that's at the 69th percentile. Down here, it says, if a student gets an SAT score of 1337, find the equivalent ACT score. Here's what I recommend. I don't care if you wanna write it down or not or whatever. Find the, um, you can f find the percentile of the student with this. So basically do normal CDF with the SAT score of 1337. Then take that value and do inverse norm with the ACT information to get the ACT score. Did that make sense? So find the find the the proportion or the probability. So do normal CDF with this 1337 or less. So negative 1899 to 1337 with the standard the um, SAT stuff up here. Find that probability. Write that down. I would go out to like four decimal places. Then take that four decimal place that you just got and use inverse norm with the ACT information. So you're going forwards and then you're going backwards with the other information. Once you get there, hopefully it'll make sense. Okay, I'm gonna scroll up. These are the questions that most people ask me questions about. Let me scroll up here. Like this right here. This shaded area is 0.96. That is the center 96%. So I'm going to draw this real quick. I'm going to get to a different screen if it'll let me. Or just find an empty spot. Let's find a good empty spot back here. Okay, let's just erase everything on this screen. Hold on a second here. I'm gonna draw what I have, what we have there. Delete. Okay, and draw it. That's eh, not a pen. Okay. So this is basically that problem. Is my drawings obviously better? So this is the middle ninety-six percent. Therefore, there's four percent left over. So there's. 2% down here and 2% here. So this would be, that is in an awkward spot. Let's move it up here. So this right here would be the 0 0.02 and this right here would be 0.98, correct? So that's what you would use in your inverse norm. So they're just not saying the words, but they're asking you to find the Z scores at the edge of the middle 96%. So just use inverse norm. I would do like this, inverse norm 0 0.0201, because remember, if we're using Z scores, then our, um, then our mean and standard deviation are zero and one, and then inverse norm 0.98, zero, one. So that's what you're going to do. That's looking for the, the boundaries. And what you're going to notice, these Z-scores, you this Z-score and this Z-score 
are going to be the same, just opposites. One will be positive and one will be negative. So real quick. 0 0.02, 0, 1. So this Z score right here, this Z equals negative 2.05. This one right here is just 2.05. If you are looking at the center anything, those Z scores will just be opposites of each other. The same Z score, just positive and negative. So you only have to find one. So right here, this right here should be negative 0 0.205, and then this one's positive 0 0.2 2.05. They're the same, just opposites. So same thing. I think there's another center one. No, that one's different. You're looking at the Z score. I don't think there's another center one. Rude. There's not another center one. But if you had a different problem, I wonder if it'll let me choose a different problem. Similar question. Not yet. I have to submit an answer. Never mind. But you'll see. So they're, they're going to be the same Z scores, just opposites. So that's all I have. Are there any questions while we're being recorded? We'll go back to the end. Okay. And then get back to my last screen. Okay. I'm going to turn off the recording. Stop recording.